Major news here on Prime. If there is a hell on earth today, its name is Northern Gaza. The mass exodus happening in Gaza with thousands of Palestinians fleeing the region's main hospital after several reported strikes as the humanitarian crisis there continues to worsen by the day. Plus, if we could gather novel data from those that have died by suicide, we might be able to recreate the last year of life. Could a loved one's computer and cell phone data prevent future deaths? How one organization is working to use AI to help stave off the spate of suicides among veterans. And 17 years after a bomb nearly killed him, celebrated newsman Bob Woodruff returns to Iraq. We're with Bob as he chronicles his years-long journey after the blast. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ariel Reshef in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more. Including the diplomatic cables now made public that show U.S. foreign officers around the world concerned over the impact that a protracted Israel-Hamas war could have on the region. Plus, the assault against a former U.S. senator and combat veteran, how she fought off her attacker, and why the mayor of the largest city in America just had his phone seized by the FBI. Our correspondents are fanned out across the world covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we begin with the mass exodus in Gaza. Thousands of Palestinians are on the move. The humanitarian crisis is deepening by the day. Many civilians are now trying to leave northern Gaza to head south. A spokesperson for the UN said, quote, if there is a hell on earth today, its name is Northern Gaza. Israel has continued to ramp up its attacks against Hamas. Hospitals in Gaza City are at the center of the chaos. Explosions rocking a refugee encampment outside Gaza's largest hospital. In a second attack, a strike hit an outpatient clinic where people were taking shelter. Israel's prime minister visiting troops situated at the border with Gaza today. Benjamin Netanyahu telling troops there that his primary goal is to eliminate Hamas. Meantime, urgent negotiations now underway for the more than 200 hostages caught in the middle of all of this violence. ABC's Matt Gutman leads us off tonight from Israel. Tonight, the explosions rattling Gaza's main hospitals, buildings shuddering, and the cries from the wounded. By night, the sky lit up by flares and missiles. By day, Israeli troops in close combat, going building to building, room to room, closing their noose on northern Gaza. The hospital's main parking lots now housing tents filled with people. The hallways crammed with refugees, gurneys bearing the wounded lining the corridors. Today, an explosion at Gaza's main hospital, Al-Shifa. This girl screaming, why God, why? Israel saying the explosion was caused by a failed Palestinian rocket launch. Military spokesman Peter Lerner says Hamas has turned the hospitals into their base of operations. They have positioned all of their capabilities in, around and beneath hospitals. But if there are thousands of patients who are wounded, some of them very severely, who cannot be moved. They can be moved. There are ambulance services that are up and running. It's a matter of deciding to move them. But one of Al Shifa's top doctors telling me it can't be done. What would happen if you did have to evacuate all the people who still remain? If you say evacuate the patients, you means you want me to kill at least 100 patients at one second. Tonight, with the Palestinians saying the death toll is over 11,000, the strongest criticism yet by the U.S. of Israel's handling of the war against Hamas. Far too many Palestinians have been killed. Far too many have suffered. But Secretary of State Blinken acknowledging Israel has opened humanitarian corridors. Thousands today fleeing south on this highway, an evacuation route designed by the Israeli military. Over 150,000 fleeing in just the past two days. The elderly often pulled along on carts, many carrying white flags. And tonight, the New York Times reporting progress is being made on a deal that could see the release of scores of the 239 hostages still held in Gaza. That would include most of the women and children, including Shiri Bibas. That video showing her terror as she was kidnapped from her kibbutz, along with her two children, Kfir, only 10 months old. What milestones should Kfir, who's now 10 months, be meeting? Maybe walking a few steps, recognizing faces, smiling faces. I can't, I can't. What, I mean, what is it like thinking that the faces he's now learning to recognize are most likely those of his captors. It's heartbreaking. 
so many families in agony tonight. And Matt joins us live from Tel Aviv. And Matt, while Israel is focused on fighting in Gaza, it's also involved on multiple fronts right now. What are some of the biggest concerns tonight? Israel has said that its forces over the past 24 hours have operated not just in the Gaza Strip, but also the West Bank, along the Red Sea, in Syria and in Lebanon, where it's been fighting this low-level war with a very powerful Iranian-backed proxy, Hezbollah. The concern is that that could turn into a major war with just one wrong move on either side. And in order to try to prevent that, the U.S. has sent, uh, as part of the major reason that they're here, those two carrier groups which are parked just here in the eastern Mediterranean. Ariel. Tireless work there from you, Matt. Gutman, stay safe for us. And now to those warnings from American diplomats abroad. ABC's Selena Wang joins us from the White House. And Selena, what are diplomats hearing? Well, Ariel, what we're hearing is that these American diplomats are saying that there is deep anger in the Arab world towards the U.S. over America's staunch support of Israel and the rising death toll in Gaza. A State Department source confirming a CNN report that these American officials, they are telling their Washington counterparts that public opinion of the U.S. and the Arab world could be damaged for a generation. Now, a senior administration official telling me that the White House respects strong feelings on all sides. They encourage these officials to be transparent and forthcoming with their feelings. And they say the U.S. will continue to support Israel and the people of Gaza. And Selena, the White House confirmed today that President Biden will hold a summit with China's President Xi next week in San Francisco. We know that relations with China have been especially rocky lately. President Biden is expected to talk about the war between Israel and Hamas. What is the president planning to push for here? Well, look, China and Iran, they have close relations. So the president is going to try and urge Xi Jinping to use that influence, to leverage it, to try and have Iran not further escalate this through itself or through its proxies. Now, the real purpose of this high stakes meeting between President Biden and Xi Jinping is to manage tensions and also to try and restore those critical military to military communications. But don't expect any major breakthroughs here, given how deep the divisions between the U.S. and China are. But the fact that this meeting is even happening at all well, that is a big win for global stability. Ariel? All eyes will be on that meeting. Selena Wang, our thanks to you. As the crisis worsens in the Gaza Strip, UNICEF said today that medical care at the children's hospitals there has all but ceased. UNICEF saying a small generator is the only thing powering the intensive care and neonatal intensive care units after the al Rantisi and al Nasser children's hospitals were attacked. A UNICEF spokesperson saying, quote, children in Gaza are hanging by a thread, particularly in the north. These children have nowhere to go and are at extreme risk. We call for the attacks on health care facilities to stop immediately. Immediately. That is the message from many healthcare workers and aid workers in the Gaza Strip. Joining us now for more is pediatric intensive care doctor Tanya Haj Hassan of Doctors Without Borders, who is in London right now. Dr. Haj Hassan, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. As a critical care doctor who has worked for years in the field of humanitarian aid, what are you hearing from your colleagues on the ground in Gaza and specifically at Al Shifa Hospital? I mean, it's a catastrophe. Words escape me. Um, I, I, I had a very short night last night, and in the four or five hours that I was in bed, I uh, woke up at the end of it to a message to hear that Al Shifa Hospital had been struck three times. It had been targeted three times with airstrikes. Uh, and, uh, uh, they, they told me that the front entrance of the hospital was hit, the emergency department entrance was hit, the back was hit, and the labor and delivery, delivery ward was hit. I then received a flood of videos of the massacre uh, of civilians who were sheltering in the hospital, uh, in the compound of the hospital. There were 13 people that were killed uh, instantly. Uh, a young girl screaming for her father, a man lying on the ground uh, with uh, a leg that had been amputated by, by the strike. Uh, he was hemorrhaging and, and screaming for help on the ground, another man with a very severe head injury, and uh, a few dead children. Um, that was the footage inside the hospital compound from the airstrike. The, um, my colleagues were obviously very distraught. The um, director of surgery at the, this hospital uh, subsequently sent us a, a message saying, dear colleagues, the situation in Shifa now is extremely dangerous. We as medical staff want to leave, but we cannot. 
We might not survive till the morning. We don't want to be killed here, just only because we remain committed to our patients and our medical profession. I am calling for help urgently. Please do whatever you can through your government or through the International Red Cross to arrange a safe corridor for the medical staff. Please treat this as top urgent. I have been able to reach one of my colleagues who fled to the south. Uh, she is safe. She is distraught. She is uh, in tears. Uh, the the rest of the staff who who I who I, who I know who work there, I have not been able to reach them uh, since last night. I I, I don't know uh, what they're going through at the moment. I I can only imagine how uh, horrific it is if. If anything is more horrifying than what we've been seeing in the last month, every day we need we reach a new low in human catastrophe, human hundred percent mad man made catastrophe. The IDF has denied responsibility for any strike on the hospital, but it is no doubt now the epicenter of heavy fighting. The IDF has maintained uh, and recently made public what it considers to be evidence that Hamas is utilizing hospitals as weapons depots and headquarters. Are you seeing that and evidence of that in your work and from your colleagues Absolutely on the not. ground? Absolutely not. Um, I have also worked in these hospitals, and I can tell you they are functioning hospitals, and I have never seen any military activity in them. It is prohibited under international law to target a functioning hospital and can be considered a war crime. It is no doubt the situation is dire. Israel says that it has now enacted these four-hour humanitarian pauses. Do you believe that this may help patients and staff safely evacuate? I, I, this, this concept of a pause doesn't make sense. You don't pause bombardment to, to allow people to move then just to bomb them again or to allow uh, uh, some water in just to then kill them thereafter. What is needed is a ceasefire, is, 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 is a cessation, a complete stop of the violence is what is needed. I, 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 I can't seem to understand what a pause in violence means if you're intending to resume violence straight after. Dr. Haj Hassan, thank you so much for staying up late and giving us your insight. We appreciate it. Tonight, the FBI has seized phones and electronic devices belonging to New York City Mayor Eric Adams. It comes one week after agents searched the home of his chief fundraiser. ABC's senior investigative report, reporter Aaron Katursky joins us now. And Aaron, what is Mayor Adams saying to this tonight? Well, he's pledging to cooperate, Ariel, with an ongoing federal corruption investigation. It was after an event on Monday night over at NYU when FBI agents approached the mayor. He handed over two phones and an iPad. The mayor has not been accused of any wrongdoing here, but as you note, it does come one week after the FBI searched the home in Brooklyn of his top fundraiser as part of an investigation into whether any illegal foreign money from Turkey entered the mayor's campaign coffers through a Brooklyn construction company. The mayor says in a statement tonight, Ariel, I have nothing to hide. We know you will continue following this for us. Aaron Katursky, thank you so much. And in New Jersey, the manhunt for Gregory Yetman has come to an end. Yetman is charged with several offenses, some of them felonies, stemming from the January 6th assault on the U.S. Capitol. The FBI says that Yetman turned himself in today without incident. Those charges include assaulting officers, obstruction of law enforcement, and act of physical violence in the Capitol grounds or buildings, among others. He is now in custody of the U.S. Marshals and is expected to make an initial court appearance on Monday. Former Arizona Senator Martha McSally fought off an attacker during a visit to Council Bluffs, Iowa. Surveillance video leading to the arrest of her assailant overnight, but the combat veteran says it's all taken a toll, bringing back difficult memories of being raped by a senior officer when she was in the service. Here's ABC's Faith Abube and a warning that details of this story are difficult. Tonight, the stunning revelation from former Arizona Senator Martha McSally, the first American woman to fly a fighter plane in combat. I was just assaulted while I was out running. I realize I'm still in an adrenaline state. I am okay. These chilling images from a surveillance video captured moments before the attack on Wednesday. Authorities say this is the suspect, following McSally closely along the Missouri River in Iowa. A man came up behind me 
and he engulfed me in a bear hug and he molested and fondled me until I fought him off. McSally says she then turned the tables, chasing him and throwing a water bottle at him before he ran off into a heavily wooded area. The suspect, 25-year-old Dominique Henton, arrested on a warrant overnight in Nebraska for assault with intent to commit sexual abuse. I was preyed upon and then raped by a superior officer. In 2019, McSally disclosed during a Senate hearing that she's a rape survivor from her time in the Air Force. Wednesday's attack, reopening old wounds. But in this case, I felt like I took my power back. He tried to take power from me, but I turned it on him and he was running from me. An aerial that suspect will be extradited back to Iowa in the coming days to face criminal charges. Ariel. Faith, our thanks to you. One of the nation's largest credit rating agencies, Moody's, is now changing the U.S. outlook to negative. The news comes as Congress inches closer to a possible government shutdown. Moody's said it was the, quote, political divisions in the U.S. and, quote, renewed debt limit brinkmanship and also blamed the first ever ouster of a House speaker for its credit downgrade. If Congress does not act, a shutdown would occur in just seven days. Next tonight, the son of a prominent Hollywood executive has been arrested on suspicion of murder. It comes after the gruesome discovery of body parts in a dumpster. The suspect's wife and her parents are missing. ABC's Mola Lange is in Los Angeles. Tonight, Los Angeles authorities are urgently searching for a woman and her parents after discovering a dismembered body in this strip mall dumpster and accusing the woman's husband of murder. Next to City Bank on Rubio, possible body inside trash can. Early Wednesday morning, police called to that strip mall, finding the remains inside a plastic bag. A uh, dismembered female body was located. It's basically just a torso, a female torso. The lead investigator on the case telling ABC News that torso remains unidentified. But authorities have accused 35-year-old Samuel Haskell of murder. And they say that Haskell's wife, May, along with her parents, who live in the same house as the couple, are all missing. Police say they traced the suspect using surveillance video from that strip mall and from a separate 911 call reporting suspicious bags outside his home. Here in the house, once uh, officers made entry, um, what was discovered was evidence of a crime, including some blood evidence. The suspect is the son of Sam Haskell Sr., the former CEO of Miss America and an ex-Hollywood agent who represented stars like George Clooney and Dolly Parton. Tonight, the family's shocked neighbors left fearing the worst. Today, I was crying, thinking how I'm probably never going to see her or her parents. It's a really sad thought to me. Just a harrowing story. Mola joins us now from Los Angeles. And Mola, what do we know about the suspect and where he is right now? Well, Ariel, he's being held on a $2 million bond tonight, although no formal charges have been filed. And we should also know where his children are. Haskell and his wife have three elementary school-aged children together who are in the care of other family tonight. Thinking of those young children tonight, Mola, thank you. And now we take you to the Arizona-Mexico border and the forefront of the fight to keep deadly fentanyl out of this country. ABC's Maria Villarreal went to the area where half of the seizures of that potent drug happen and where officials say they need more funding to keep up the fight. Tonight at the Mariposa port of entry in Nogales, Arizona, a rare look at the fight to stop the river of fentanyl flowing into the country. This is a vehicle where we found a load. Less um, than an hour after we arrive, agents using this high-tech x-ray machine make a bust, finding more than 20 pounds of fentanyl pills, heroin, and meth hidden in a spare tire. In November, right here, we seized almost 300 pounds of fentanyl. Uh, that's in anything from gas tanks to quarter panels. To on people. Fentanyl is 50 times more potent than heroin, and synthetic opioids like illegally manufactured fentanyl took 72,000 lives last year. Just this week, officials in Massachusetts announcing more than 200 pounds of fentanyl seized from a single home, including 20 pounds of pink heart-shaped pills designed to look like Valentine's candy. Customs and Border Protection seizing more than 27,000 pounds of fentanyl over 12 months, nearly double the amount from a year earlier. But it just keeps coming. Is the headline here, we are struggling in this fight against fentanyl? The headline here is we need additional resources to continue our fight against fentanyl. 
Our thanks to Maria for that reporting. And now to a warning. Ahead of the holiday travel season, the chair of the National Transportation Safety Board is telling lawmakers that a surge in, quote, close calls at U.S. airports is a clear warning sign that the aviation system is under strain. ABC Transportation correspondent Gio Benitez reports. While these events are incredibly rare, our safety system is showing clear signs of strain that we cannot ignore. Fear from top aviation officials, the lead investigator at the NTSB, telling a Senate subcommittee that a shortage of air traffic controllers is leading to fatigue and distraction, likely contributing to a growing list of planes nearly colliding on takeoff and landing. It only takes one missed warning to become a tragedy. The FAA identified 23 close calls in the last year, including a Delta plane at JFK in New York, almost colliding with an American Airlines flight on the wrong runway. And in Austin, Texas, a FedEx cargo plane came within 100 feet of a Southwest flight packed with passengers. Southwest aboard. FedEx is on the go. We're so short-staffed and most or many of our facilities uh, that service air travel right now, that we don't have the opportunity or the capacity to have uh, a five-day work week. We're now less than two weeks away from the busiest travel time of the year. Nearly half of Americans are expected to travel between Thanksgiving and mid-January. Air traffic controllers are being uh, required to do mandatory overtime. What happens with mandatory overtime? It ends up leading to fatigue and distraction. Thanks to Gio for that reporting. And the Big Ten is coming down on the undefeated University of Michigan football team. Head coach Jim Harbaugh is now banned from the sidelines for the rest of the regular season as part of a sign-stealing investigation. Big Blue accused of sending people to games to scout and decode signals used by future opponents. The league says Harbaugh may not have known about this plot but was suspended to punish the school. Michigan is seeking a court order to block that decision. And a curious critter long thought to be extinct has reemerged in the difficult to explore Cyclops Mountains of Indonesia. The long lost, long beaked akinda was discovered by Oxford University researchers and even made an on camera appearance. Spiky and furry. There he is, kind of cute. One of the only mammals to lay eggs. They are thought to have roamed the earth with the dinosaurs, but they're shy and they like to burrow, so they hadn't been seen in more than 60 years. Still much more to get to right here on Prime. Coming up, two college students say that they were targeted for being Jewish. The hate crime investigation that's underway right now at a university in Ohio. Plus, Next in our prime focus, we'll tell you about an organization that's using AI to prevent suicide deaths among mili military service members. If we could gather novel data from those that have died by suicide, we might be able to recreate the last year of life. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Welcome back. Ahead of Veterans Day, we want to shed light on an organization that recently received government funds to use AI to analyze computers and cell phone data left behind by military service members who died by suicide. Organizers hope the insights gathered will help prevent future suicide deaths among the military ranks and possibly beyond. ABC's M. Wynn has the story in tonight's prime focus and a warning to our viewers. Our next story deals with the difficult subject of suicide and some may find it triggering. Spread across this table, the cell phones, tablets, and laptops of veterans, all of whom took their own lives. Inside each device is what one organization believes holds the key to preventing the nation's growing number of military suicides. If we could gather novel data from those that have died by suicide, we might be able to recreate the last year of life. That information, Stop Soldier Suicide CEO Chris Ford says, may be able to help his nonprofit gain insight into the telltale signs that a service member may be considering suicide and what may have led up to that final decision. Ford naming this initiative the Black Box Project after the black boxes found on planes that help trace the origin of aviation incidents. According to the VA, veterans are 57% more at risk for suicide than non-military adults, and more than 6,000 veterans die a year from suicide. I think we can prevent needless suffering and a ton of loss of life. This phone belonged to Connor McDaniel, the beloved son of David McDaniel. This is the flag that um, was draped over his coffin. Yeah. This father proudly sharing the military memorabilia honoring his son. He wanted to go directly fight the bad guys. Connor joined the army right out of high school. His dad saying his bright personality carried with him, even during his deployment to Afghanistan, where he was assigned to protect local villages from the Taliban. Some of his army buddies told me that he was making them laugh while they were being shelled in, um, in Afghanistan. But it wasn't long after Connor came home that David says he sensed a shift in his son's behavior. There was definitely more anger, um, a lot of frustration, a lot of gloominess. Mm. It was September 1st, 2021, when David says his son entered a wooded area with a firearm. I start screaming his name as I'm walking up the field. Uh, and just then the police, the, the sheriff's department shows up and they tell me to come back down. He followed their direction, but on the car ride home, an officer called him. Said that Connor, said that Connor was dead, that he had fired upon the, the, the sheriff's deputies and they had returned fire and killed him. Connor was just 26 years old. His death determined to be a suicide. The district attorney's office concluding the officer's actions were justified. Disbelief. I, just, I still have a hard time believing that I'm never going to see him again. Grappling with Connor's choices, David was immediately drawn to the Black Box Project, which uses forensic software to unlock and comb through deceased service members' devices provided by their loved ones to review their activity in the weeks leading up to their death. McDaniel works in the tech field and says if the project can find repeated patterns in, for instance, online searches, they may be able to help others. I know for a fact that my son uh, searched for um, SGLI, <clears throat> it's the Soldier's General Life Insurance. So when a soldier searches for SGLI and maybe some other words like suicide, that's going to be a clear trigger that um, they are, may need help. 
And you're hoping what would come up? I'm hoping an ad for Stop Soldier Suicide would come up literally in the Google results on the first line and say, hey, if you're considering you know, harming yourself, please reach out. Ford says they use machine learning, natural language processing, a subcomponent of artificial intelligence to analyze text and notes in order to determine sentiment or emotional tone, such as anger or desperation. He says they can also track phone usage to monitor sleep cycles and trace the subject's geolocations. How does AI play a role? Well, machines can go through computations a lot faster than humans, and they can find signals that we often miss. Looks like we have an Android and Ford Indian. says the Black Box project, which launched in April 2020, has received over 100 devices. So far, he says they're seeing three patterns before most of these suicides. More anger, different sleep patterns, and social isolation. We'll make a forensic copy of these. He says he's also finding new patterns that may possibly refute prior conceptions around suicide, where some studies suggest a minority of all suicide victims leave a note. We're actually finding in our test data that there are drafted and deleted suicide notes in more than half the devices we've looked at. Ford's team includes PhDs in clinical psychology and suicide researchers, and they work with a scientific advisory committee which helps steer where and what to look for. Stop Soldier Suicide says the goal with these findings, though still preliminary, is to help the nonprofit decide where, when, and how to target its own mental health resources. For instance, adding more hotline staff at certain hours and ensuring calls are picked up overnight. Did you ever question if you thought this project would be a breach of privacy for those who had already passed, even though they were already gone? Absolutely. Uh, we take our client data and their privacy front of mind every day. Current privacy laws do not carry on past death, meaning the next of kin typically gains new authority. We don't resell the data. We don't push it out to others. We use it for our own research purposes so that we can best understand risk uh, and then give those devices back to those families intact. I actually come onto the installation probably two to three times a month. Petra Jackson yes. Oxford was married to Anthony just short of 32 years before he died by suicide. I feel closest to him because this is where he was stationed. This is where I met him. This is where he did his last tour. She says the day she lost her husband started like any other morning. And I talked to him while I was in the kitchen and he didn't say anything. And then as I'm walking back into the den and walking towards him sitting in the reclining chair, I realize he's not alive anymore. He took his life. Jackson Oxford was left with mounting questions and a phone, which she gave to the Black Box Project, ultimately hoping the contribution could save even one life. I truly believe he would have been okay with it. And it's, it's a hard thing for a survivor to give up something so personal as his cell phone. What do you think the military meant for him? Everything in terms of who he was as an individual. It was almost um, his identity? Yeah, it was definitely his identity. These men and women are putting their lives on the line for us. Now, Jackson Oxford says she's dedicating yes. her life to helping other surviving Turn service off, so family members like connect with helpful measures. Your loss became your mission. No your one loss. should have no resource. Resources, also a concern for McDaniel, who's advocating for new legislation to remove the stigma around mental health in the military. Because most mental health assistance is optional post-deployment, he's proposing making evaluations mandatory after returning home from combat. Anywhere where you saw combat, you would basically be required to have some mental health counseling. The Black Box Project was awarded $3 million in funding from the VA earlier this year. These things are everything to us. Without it, there's no project. Ford says there's a long road ahead before understanding if and how they might prevent military suicides. And he hopes that one day this initiative may not only save the lives of service members, but countless others. Why can't the insights we gain about people who have been traumatized before they joined the military and while they served and apply those learnings to other people that have also been traumatized. Fascinating and important work there. Our thanks to M for that report. Stop Soldier Suicide says they anticipate publishing some new insights learned from this project before the end of the year. And if you or someone you care about is struggling with thoughts of suicide, text or call the Crisis Lifeline at 988. Free help is available 24-7.
24-7. Still ahead here on Prime, the popular tourist attraction in Iceland forced to temporarily close after a series of earthquakes rocked the region. Plus, one-on-one -on -one with Logan Paul, the social media star turned entrepreneur responds to concerns his energy drink isn't safe for kids and accusations the company is targeting them. And it's the top honor in music, the Grammy Awards. This year, women are dominating the list of nominees. We're doing a girl-powered breakdown of the nominations by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach and I kick her extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. What You Need to Know, a third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, Afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. It is that time of the year again. The Recording Academy has announced their 2024 Grammy nominees, and this year the list is all about girl power. Let's take a look at the nominations by the numbers. SZA led the pack with a whopping nine nominations overall for her album SOS and the songs on it covering genres from pop to rap to R&B. The record song and album of the year categories are almost 
all women with seven female acts nominated in each category, including Boy Genius, Victoria Monet, and Taylor Swift. Only one male act was nominated in all of these categories, and that was John Batiste. And yes, back to Taylor Swift, she made Grammy Awards history today. The singer is now the first person ever to be nominated in the Song of the Year category seven times in a career this year with her song, Anti-Hero, and it's a good one. And one nomination that feels a little bit like a throwback, the iconic song Fast Car by Tracy Chapman, which was originally released in 1988, is back on the list of nominees. This time, Luke Combs' cover of Fast Car is nominated for Best Country Solo Performance, the nomination coming 34 years after Fast Car's original win for Song and Record of the Year. By the way, this will be the 65th annual Grammy Awards, and the winners are revealed in February. And much more ahead still here on Prime. The number of fake threats called into police skyrocketing nationwide. Why the FBI is now calling this a public safety crisis. Plus, 17 years after a roadside bomb nearly took his life in Iraq, our Bob Woodruff returns to where it all happened, what he's saying about his grueling recovery, and why he decided to go back. But first, a look at our top trending headlines on abcnews.com. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shot. Mrs. Kennedy's lair was stained with her husband's blood. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. The common data was saying, Lyndon Johnson, now president of the United States. That was when the enormity struck me. I was walking on to a stage for a part I had never rehearsed. I ought to record this. Dr. King's been shot. Senator Kennedy had been shot, but Vietnam dominated the news. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. Was it because I was alive? The greatest courage is to go about the day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. An anti-Semitic attack at a university in Ohio. A brazen carjacking caught on camera in Chicago and the FBI warning about a spike in swatting incidents. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. Police in Ohio issuing a public safety notice after two anti-Semitic incidents on and off campus at Ohio State University. According to the school's Jewish Student Center, two people vandalized Israeli flags that were displayed in the building's lobby. In a separate incident off campus, authorities say two students were targeted and assaulted. The students say they were asked if they were Jewish, then attacked. Ohio's governor promising the state will protect all Ohio students, ordering increased police patrols at Ohio State. A manhunt underway in Chicago for a second suspect after a brazen carjacking caught on camera. Chicago police say one suspect is in custody and has been charged with a misdemeanor. Footage from a doorbell camera shows two armed men rushing a family getting out of a car in their own driveway. Michelle Pettiford said she screamed as she was pushed to the ground by one of the assailants. Her husband Jeff held at gunpoint and giving up the keys. The couple said they were returning from their daughter's volleyball practice and were not injured in the robbery. The FBI is warning of an explosion in the number of swatting incidents, fake threats of active shooters, bombs or violence meant to provoke an armed police response. Somebody who makes one of these phony 911 calls could face criminal charges, anything from providing false information, even stalking. And for police, after 20 years of being trained to drop everything and run toward active shooter calls, the FBI is now working to retrain officers. Take an extra second, evaluate the call, because when police arrive with weapons drawn, there can be real danger and the risk of a mistake is high. Apple has agreed to pay $25 million to settle claims that it engaged in a pattern of discriminatory hiring practices. That settlement stemming from jobs that Apple filled in 2018 and 2019. Justice Department claims Apple favored immigrant workers over U.S. citizens while hiring for some jobs. Apple acknowledging they were not following the DOJ's rules and vowed to change their policies going forward. That settlement is the largest in the Department of Justice history relating to citizenship based discrimination. U.S. Air Force's new bomber is taking flight. The B-21 bomber made its first flight just after sunrise in Southern California today. The public got its first look at the B-21 last year. The military has been developing it for at least a decade. The strategic bomber is a long-range nuclear-capable aircraft with advanced stealth technology. Each B-21 is estimated to cost roughly $750 million. The U.S. Air Force plans to buy 100 of them from defense contractor Northrop Grumman. The Census Bureau says the world population has topped 8 billion for the first time in history. The agency pointing out the United Nations announced the same thing last year, but the Bureau says some countries count their people differently than others, lending to differences in population estimates. Modern humans have been on Earth roughly 200,000 years, which is a relatively small time compared to the estimated 4.5 billion year old planet Earth. Scientists say the population growth is due to people living longer than their ancestors. Influencer turned businessman Logan Paul is no stranger to controversy, but now he's responding to accusations his energy drink called Prime is unsafe for children. ABC's Eva Pilgrim sat down with the internet celebrity and has his story. At just 28 years old, Logan Paul has over 91 million followers combined across his social platforms. What do you guys say? You want to sell some lemonade? Yeah, yeah let's go! Logan, one of the first helping create the world of social media influencers, has been a lot of things. YouTuber, boxer, even WWE champion, and now entrepreneur. His latest business venture, Prime, making sports and energy drinks. We want Prime! We want Prime! The company recently selling its one billionth bottle. 
reaching $1.2 billion in sales. The hydration category was a bit archaic. Uh, a lot of the leading companies in the uh, vertical are really high sugar and have really old formulas. We saw an opportunity to make a great product that was a better for you product. Prime's drinks have zero added sugar, but the company's energy drink has 200 milligrams of caffeine, catching the attention of politicians like New York Senator Chuck Schumer, criticizing the company for marketing to young fans. Are you guys targeting children? That's such a, a heavy claim, but I want to dive into it. Um, you know, we are a social media first company. The good thing about social media is there's data, right? There's analytics. 90% of my audience is above the age of 18. 93% of Prime's audience is above the age of 18, according to Instagram's analytics. Still, there's a public concern over kids' exposure to energy drinks. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, caffeine and other stimulant substances contained in energy drinks have no place in the diet of children and adolescents. Is there anything that you would say to parents or kids out there that are young? Yeah, I mean, um, caffeine consumption isn't recommended for kids or anyone under the age of 18. That's an industry, industry standard thing, not a prime specific one. People need to be smart about what they're putting in their bodies. Logan acknowledges he's grown up a lot since his early days on social media. People love to hate you. <laughs> it's fun. Sometimes I hate myself. Like it. it Social media is not real. For those of you watching this, put your phone down, get away from social media, go outside, take a breath of fresh air. What are you gonna do next? Honestly, I just wanna be a good dad. It's cool to make your own legacy. I think it's much cooler to create someone who has the potential to make a legacy of their own. Our thanks to Eva for that. And we reached out to Instagram for comment on those analytics Logan mentioned and have not heard back. Turning now to Iceland, where tourists are racing to leave following a relentless series of earthquakes. Iceland is reporting roughly 1,400 quakes in 24 hours, 135 of those quakes hitting in just one hour. Iceland's famous Blue Lagoon has temporarily closed. The country is home to one of the most active volcanic areas in the world. The series of earthquakes began last month. In 2006, ABC News anchor Bob Woodruff was at the height of his career when he was sent to war-torn Iraq. While he was there, an improvised explosive device detonated, striking his vehicle. Bob and his cameraman narrowly survived that blast. Bob was left with a traumatic brain injury. Now, years later, Bob is taking viewers on a remarkable journey, from his years-long recovery to his path back to Iraq, where he nearly died 17 years ago. Let's take a look now at the new ABC News special, After the Blast, The Will to Survive. Thinking about go back to Iraq. Really? I, I think of the possibility for sort of a little closure, you know, from your experience. Uh, I wish you luck anyway. Love you. You want to go back there partly to see what's happening in the country, but also kind of get rid of this, this guilt from your soul. And Bob Woodruff is here in studio with us tonight. It is so good to see you, my friend. Oh, thanks for having us. So we see there that you went through this physical recovery, but now we're actually watching you mentally recover from what you went through. Why talk about this now? Why showcase this now? You know, I guess it's not so much to talk about it in the sense that I've really been talking about it for the last 17 years for the kind of, you know, missions we've had to try to get people wake up about the wars and what's happened with the veterans, but, uh, you know, I also have this feeling that I've been wanting to go back to this exact spot where we were targeted almost 18 years ago now. Um, because one, I wanted to sort of say goodbye to it. You know, I've been, since I wanted to go back, and really what I always consider is finishing that assignment that we had. But the other one is the, the vehicle that we were in was an Iraqi vehicle when we were hit. And the, one of the others that was wounded was an Iraqi gunner on the top, and I've never met him before. I've never really known many details about what happened to him, and I just wanted to see him. So I got a chance to meet him on that site where we went, and I could see that he got both of his middle fingers blasted off by that IED explosion while, you know, hit, you know, shattered my left part of my shoulder and my, my, my skull, and, uh, and dug my cameraman uh, on his head, too. So I just wanted to meet them for the first time and just to also to tell them, you know, we're here, we've survived, to give them some relief on it too. You talk about that guilt of not finishing the work that right. you had started. 
Run us through some of the emotions that you felt as you were driving to that site. You know, the, the, the guilt in the sense that I felt like we didn't finish our job, right? That's, that's one, it's kind of a simpler thing. I think the other one in terms of the guilt is that anybody that I'm so close to so many veterans that have gone through similar things, the one that's the most painful, I think, is to, to leave safely after something like that, leaving behind those that are worse, killed, badly wounded, um, or just, just those who have to continue to stay there and take the risk. And your son, Mac, just 14 years old, when you were injured, yeah. you went back with him. He's now a cameraman, a photographer, and he captured some of the emotions yeah. of this trip. Take a look. It's been my dream to come back and at least finally see the place and just tell those that were there and witnessed it that we're, we're okay. Be all right, brother. Don't worry. <laughs> I, mean, I could tell you that I'm a crybaby anyway. <laughs> That's true. Hard not to get emotional <laughs> yeah. watching that. So going through it, I can't even imagine. You what know, was know. it like having well, Mac there facing you as you're going through this journey? I know, I know. Well, the first thing I think about is, is it responsible as a father to be okay with your son going back to a former war zone, really? It's not as dangerous like it was back then. There's that a feeling about, is that responsible as a father to do that? I'm, I'm, it, I'm, I'm fine because he's now 32 and he's in the same industry. He's been to Ukraine four times anyway, towards the front line. So it's not like I can take this out of his own soul. How did he respond to the entire experience? You know, he had, he had some he had some tears too a little bit. And he's certainly not a crybaby like his father, <laughs> but uh, he, he it's a lot of emotion for him to go back there because you know he, he was 14 when this happened and he he knew what the world had become because of it. But he wants to, uh, to, to, see, to see him, I guess for him to see his father take him to that exact spot. You have channeled your harrowing experience into the Bob Woodruff Foundation. How important has that been for you to take your tragedy and turn it into a triumph for veterans? You know, this is uh, sometimes I say the only good thing about being blown up in, the, <laughs> in this case is that you're able to do something that's much more satisfying and fulfilling that I probably would have done. And now it's been more than 17 years and we've raised more than $150 million and put in the hands of uh, veterans pro programs and uh, around the country. So it's, we've had the, the bless to be able to pull it off. So that one, that one feels good. And that's one of the main reasons about going back is to make sure that people still know that there are wars. The sad thing, you've got stories all day you've told about Gaza and Ukraine, right? They're still here, you know, and we're going to have people that are going to serve in the country. They, these things are not going away. We're not going to have un, unending peace. Let's put it that way. So we got to remember, you know, they're here to protect our country and, and they've done so much on voluntary military. I hope you don't mind me saying, but off camera, I told you you're a miracle. You said you're just a lucky guy getting to serve our veterans out there. Yeah, you know, listen, I, that's the one that really bothers me because it's absolutely not the case. You know, why is that than others that were just killed instantly, other ones that were badly wounded, even worse? I mean, there's nothing there about something from above that says we picked you to survive. I just I just have a feeling that it's definitely not a miracle. I think it's just a, it's, it's a little bit of, I mean, there's certainly a lot of, of, of faith, certainly in this situation. But I just, I just kind of feel another <laughs> feeling of guilt if someone says it's a miracle. Well, we, we are I'm, definitely I'm lucky blessed. to have Let's you. Let's put it that way. Your family's sure. lucky to have you. We are lucky to have you as a colleague, and the world's lucky to have you uh, to serve our veterans. We appreciate you, so you being here, Bob. And you can catch ABC News Studios after the blast, The Will to Survive, streaming on Hulu. Thanks, Bob. Thank you so much. Finally tonight, a major milestone for one of the last two survivors of the Tulsa race massacre. Lessie Benningfield Randall turns 109 today. The massacre happened over 100 years ago in 1921 when hundreds of black residents were killed and businesses were destroyed by white rioters. ABC's DeMarco Morgan spoke with her last month about restoring and rebuilding the community. Her family and the community will be having a celebration of life on Saturday to commemorate this momentous occasion. We wish her well. That's our show for tonight. I'm Ariel Reshef, in for Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night, everyone.
whenever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We are now exactly one year away from what is being touted as one of the most consequential elections of our lifetime. In this special edition of Prime, we take you beyond the bluster, past the polls, to the real kitchen table issues affecting voters, the daily matters that could change the course of the country one year from now. We are truly the battleground state in America to test whether Ohioans and the rest of America are going to be ready for abortion at any time. A top of mind for many, abortion, which is galvanizing women across the country on all sides of the political spectrum, to the importance of the Latino vote. I'd say uh, it's a large percentage are Democrat generationally, but we do see a lot more young people getting involved. We consider Arizona to be a microcosm of where the nation is at now. And with special counsel investigations and criminal trials moving ahead, will the current state of politics dissuade voters from heading to the polls? And as weapons of mass destruction take countless lives in this country, will guns be the issue to motivate a new generation of voters and political candidates? A lot of our legislators are not part of the school shooting generation. They don't know what it's like to you know, do an active school shooting drill. They don't know what it's like to see their classmates you know, murdered. This is ABC News Live Prime's Your Voice, Your Vote, one year out. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are one year out from the 2024 election, and the first chapter of what already has been a bruising and long campaign season is coming to a close. A presidential election with so much on the line. Americans cast 158 million ballots in the 2020 election, yet the winner was ultimately decided by about 43,000 votes across three states, Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin. Which state will prove decisive this time around? And with polls showing it's already a dead heat, what issues will matter most to voters across this country over the next calendar year? Will abortion continue to drive Americans to the polls? How will the Israel-Hamas war impact who voters want to be the next president? And will any one group of voters be able to swing the election? For Democrats, President Biden is fighting plummeting approval ratings and a lack of enthusiasm from the base. For Republicans, after several debates, the GOP field has continued to shrink, but the former president remains the clear frontrunner. Can any of the candidates trying to take on Trump make a name for themselves without Trump participating in the debates? And will there be a 2024 surprise with Trump facing four indictments? And questions about the fitness of both Trump and Biden to be president into their 80s. There is a lot that could shake up this race. We'll be with you every step of the way, from the primaries all the way through the final votes being counted next November. This hour will break down what's at stake and who or what could shake up the 2024 race as we know it. We begin with Jay O'Brien with a big picture look at where we stand one year from the election. 